Welcome to this webinar on improving practice between social workers and disabled adults when using digital communication technologies. My name is Becky Meakin. I'm the project partner from a user-led organisation called Shaping Our Lives. The other partners are King's College London and the British Association of Social Workers, plus six disabled lay researchers, which we recruited for this study, have trained and supported to conduct all the research and to develop the final outputs. Five of the researchers are presenting with me today and are using a range of access technologies to enable them to do this. Next slide, please. So what are we going to be talking about today? And we're going to give you a very short introduction to the study. We're going to be talking about the relevance of the British Association of Social Workers Code of Ethics and the Equality Act 2010. We're going to um, give you a summary of what social workers told us about using digital communication technologies in their work and also the findings from disabled adults and their experiences of using different communication methods. Um, we'll also um, talk for a short while about how using these types of communications can impact social workers' day-to-day -day work and give you a summary of the recommendations and conclusions from this study. There will be some time for questions at the end of this webinar. Next slide, please. In this next section of the webinar, we're going to cover some of the background to our study. Next slide, please. A brief introduction to the study. Our study explored disabled people and social workers' experiences of using or not using digital technology in their interactions. When we talk about digital technologies, we mean digital communication technologies that allow two-way communication in real time, so like phone or video calls, or in sequence, like texts or emails. We also looked at some assistive technologies, software and hardware. The study was a collaboration between Shaping Our Lives, the British Association of Social Workers, King's College London, and it was funded by the National Institute of Healthcare Researchers School for Social Care Research. The study featured a team of six disabled lay researchers with training and support from an experienced researcher and mentoring from a disabled researcher. Next slide, please. Our methodology. We conducted semi-structured interviews with disabled users of adult social work services and social workers. Each participant was offered the choice of doing this interview either online so for example, through video conferencing, through the telephone, or through an email conversation. In-person was offered, but this choice was not taken up. Our sample size was 20 disabled service users and 15 social workers. We then analyzed the data over a period of months. In the next section, we're gonna talk about some of the frameworks which underpinned our study. Next slide, please. The CARE Act. The CARE Act, produced in 2014, provides the mandate for social work. This means it sets out what should happen in an assessment and when a person may be eligible for an assessment. Only a proportion of individuals will meet the threshold for this. What should happen in the care and support planning journey. And what should happen in instances of safeguarding. Well-being is covered extensively in the CARE Act, since this is what the CARE Act aims to promote. Well-being in the CARE Act means that disabled people should be supported to participate in work, education, training and recreation, supported to live and be a part of our communities, protected from abuse and neglect, and in control over the care and support provided to us. Next slide, please. The social model of disability. The social model of disability underpinned the whole of our study. The social model was a model or a way of thinking that was developed by disabled people. The social model argues that it's society that disables people by imposing barriers that prevent them from fully participating in society. Examples of barriers could include 
physical barriers such as lack of wheelchair access to a building, but it can also include barriers such as communication barriers, which might be caused by a lack of alternative formats such as Braille or BSL, or attitudinal barriers which are caused by negative assumptions about disabled people. The social model also sets out the difference between disability and impairment, which is why you might see us use the word impairment in this webinar. People have impairments. For example, a musculoskeletal condition could be considered a mobility impairment. Disability, however, is caused by society not meeting the needs of people with impairments. Next slide, please. The social model of disability contrasts with other models of disability, such as the medical model, which views disabled people as the problem which needs to be fixed or cured, or the charity model, which views disabled people's lives as tragic and pitiable. The social model says that the honours shouldn't be on disabled people to remove barriers. The disabled community is widely diverse and barriers are unique to an individual. This means that there is no one size fits all approach to removing barriers and that the process to do this will be different for each individual person. Next slide, please. We're now going to look at the British Association of Social Workers Code of Ethics and the Equality Act 2010, as there are um, a number of important areas you need to be mindful of, although I'm aware that lots of this will be familiar to you. There are three core values to the BASW Code of Ethics. These are human rights, social justice and professional integrity. And the Code of Ethics uh, is similar to the Equality Act and the Social Model of Disability. There are six core principles. Upholding and promoting human dignity and well-being, respecting the right to self-determination, promoting the right to participation, working holistically and identifying and developing strengths, as well as challenging oppression. We're now going to take a closer look at the Equality Act 2010. So the Equality Act 2010 protects people from discrimination, whether that's direct or indirect, harassment, so that is conduct of, a, of an unwanted sexual nature or relating to a protected characteristic, victimization that is anyone who takes proceedings under the act or is a witness to proceedings under the act or any other unlawful conduct there are nine protected characteristics and one of which is disability um, this is defined as a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial long-term adverse effect on your ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities and there are some examples of different uh, impairments disabilities below it's not an exhaustive list so it's physical impairment so it could be mobility related wheelchair users for example could be a cognitive impairments could be learning difficulties visual impairments and non-visible conditions for example uh, mental health issues um, fatigue based conditions or autism. And it is important to remember that um, people may have multiple protected characteristics. So not only just uh, disability, but other protected characteristics as well. And if we move forward and have a look at uh, reasonable adjustments uh, under the Equality Act, uh, it requires that deaf and disabled people can access services. Um, and that they are not put at any disadvantage to do so, and that preemptive reasonable adjustments are put in place to allow them to access services. There are no uh, set definition of what a reasonable adjustment is, but it may include something like sound and lighting adjustments, uh, alternative formats such as large print, easy read or braille, or even audio formats providing a sign language interpreter for deaf BSL users, and importantly, not providing reasonable adjustments is considered to be discriminatory.
And if we take a look in more detail at the Equality Act, for some organisations, uh, which includes local authorities, there is a public sector equality duty, which requires you to eliminate uh, unlawful discrimination, harassment or victimisation or any other uh, prohibited conduct under the Act. Uh, advance equality of opportunity between those that share a protected characteristic and those that don't and foster good relations between uh, people that have protected characteristics and those that don't. And in order to advance equality of opportunity, um, you might want to consider and be mindful of taking steps to uh, remove or minimize disadvantage uh, experienced by people due to their protected characteristic take steps to meet the needs of people with certain protected characteristics where they're different to the needs of other people and that could be for example as i mentioned earlier the reasonable adjustments put in place so sign language interpreters for deaf bsl users or um, alternative formats as i've mentioned earlier and there's another important element here which is to encourage people um, with protected characteristics to participate in activities where their, their participation is proportionately low. For example, where appropriate supported opportunities for employment or participation in co-production initiatives. The core aim of our research was to find out how social workers use digital communication technologies in practice. To do this, we asked both disabled people and social workers about the choices disabled people had been offered. Throughout the course of our research, most social workers we interviewed reported offering choices to disabled people. However, the disabled people we interviewed rarely reported receiving such choice. Additionally, when choice was offered, disabled people reported that this was restricted. This is what one service user had to say about the choices they'd been offered. When we asked them, did your social worker ever offer you a choice of communication types? They said, not really. As far as I recollect, no, they were the only two options that were available. It was either over the phone or home visit. I know since the pandemic, we've got a few more options, Zoom, etc. But I was never given those options. Even recently, when I spoke to my social worker a few weeks ago, it was only the telephone option that was mentioned. Sometimes, when disabled people were asked to use their preferred method of digital communication technology, this was refused on the basis that assessments could only be done face to face. This is what one service user said about this. Yes, the law says they should make reasonable adjustments, and you'd think using digital technology would be a reasonable adjustment. However, the law allows them to argue that it's not reasonable to do things another way because they can't properly assess you without that real-time interaction. I'm sorry, it sucks. Another way in which choice for disabled people was limited was by offering choice in name only. Another service user gave this description of their experience. The department would send multiple page surveys in the post, but say they could have it emailed to you. They tended not to be good at actually sending the email version. I'd usually have to call as the email would go unanswered. In the end, I decided that they couldn't be that interested in my feedback if they didn't make it easy for me to complete their survey. So now we just recycle those. Additionally, we also found that social workers use of digital communication technology was restricted. For instance, before COVID, social workers didn't necessarily have work mobile phones. Social workers were also frequently not allowed to use Zoom and many were not allowed to use WhatsApp. Social workers need to ensure that the process of communicating with their disabled service users is one of two-way communication as opposed to one-way transmission of information. Making information accessible is not always as simple as simply having information available in multiple formats. When it comes to ensuring accessibility, it's important to remember that many disabled people have more than one impairment and not all impairments are visible. 
So moving on to our findings on disabled people's experiences of different communication methods. Due to limited time, we can't give you an in-depth, complete detail breakdown of all of our findings. So this is rather a slice of our findings for each type of digital communication techno technologies, as well as in-person meetings and hard copy methods. Uh, next slide, please. So starting with communication via video conferencing, so that's using technologies such as uh, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, WhatsApp video calls, etc. We found that video conferencing was useful for service users as it allowed for synchronous in real time dialogue and it saves time, effort and travel cost over in-person meeting. And what is, whilst it's the nearest thing to in-person meetings and it allows to build a rapport through glimpses, glimpses into each other's world, some of the participants were interviewed felt that there were some qualitative differences. So a participant, for example, said that they felt that they could establish a rapport, watching social workers in their home, talking about their everyday lives. It started other kinds of conversations that went face to face in the premises of the usual venue. But in contrast, another participant felt that we're not wired up to be communicating on screen. Additionally, video conferences may however be problematic as it requires re reliable internet and particular hardware as well. And we should also note that video conferences, conferencing sorry, can cause uncertainty um, around privacy and confidentiality. So for example, service users might not uh, be certain of who might be overhearing um, the private conversation when using video conferencing either on their side or on the social worker side, for example. Video conferencing may nevertheless be useful for some service users, for example, those with chronic pain or fatigue who may find in-person meetings more difficult as they involve travel, but may be problematic for others. So for example, uh, service users um, with dementia or who might be blind or visually impaired and might be depending on a particular assistive technology that may be difficult to operate alongside video conferencing. Next slide, please. So for communication by email, participant found it useful as it gives a collated record of communication and it also enables to prepare in advance. It allows for transparency as well as all parties have a record that they can check, um, a, so a written record. It's also useful for information giving and for pre-circulating um, documents. However, it might be difficult to get a full picture of someone's situation via email. Um, it may nevertheless be useful to those who find live um, social interactions more stressful or those with speech impairments, but more difficult to those who find text-based communication problematic. Email may also impact on relationality, as a lot of people might find building relationship more difficult over email. And there's also a potential for slow responses or delayed conclusions um, from conversations via email. Authentication systems like egress can also be difficult uh, for some people to navigate, which might mean uh, make email more complicated and complex to use. Next slide, please. So for communication by text, participants um, found it useful, particularly for conf uh, confirming arrangements. And it may also be particularly useful for those who might want to look things up that they don't understand or those who might need extra time to process information. Texts are also usually quick to write and to read. However, they might lack visual clues and it might be like email, a bit more difficult to get a full picture of a person's situation. So it might impact on the possibility to have that sort of um, holistic approach to social work. And it might also be more challenging for those who find text-based communication problematic. So for example, people with dexterity issues or using particular software, um, assistive software, sorry. Uh, next slide, please. For communication by phone call, Similar to video conferencing, participants um, found 
phone call useful as it allow or they allow for a more synchronous dialogue and it's quick and convenient like this quote um, from one of our participants says it's simple and easy I use it on a regular basis there is no update on a phone and there is no version of a phone call uh, phone calls might also be helpful for relationship building as then um, allow for a dialogue via low tech medium so a bit uh, maybe a bit less challenging than video conferencing for some people however there may be problematic um, depending on phone signal and similar to other modes of communication that may lead to privacy concern uh, concerns again over for example who might be able to overhear a conversation um, and maybe the possibility to talk hold those conversations in a private space. Um, we also found that for some participants, phone calls might also generate a sense of intrusion from um, receiving unscheduled phone calls for which they might not be prepared. And we also found that they might um, be more problematic as they do not provide for um, a written record so my impact on the transparency of conversation um, so yeah phone calls might be uh, helpful for some disabled users but problematic for others next slide please there are also some really interesting reflections around power relationality and phone calls uh, for my interviews with participants for example um, one participant here said that I think that where you're in person it's a little bit more natural in the sense that you're given time to answer a question or to think or to ponder or reflect or change it whereas when it's telephone conversation you almost feel as though you've got to come up with the right answer right there and then next slide please Moving on to communication by a hard copy, uh, the participants that we interviewed found that hard copy can be useful as it provides a written record, but it can however be slow and needs to be filed and stored, um, even though it doesn't require hardware. Hard copy conversation also doesn't require access to or confidence with digital um, communication technologies. Um, there are also some points that were raised around confidentiality, so hard copy documents are, rec are regarded by some people as more secure than digital technologies, um, but it could nevertheless lead to some bre breaches of confidentiality, particularly for people who need extra support um, to uh, consult or to file hard copy documents. A hard copy document might particularly be challenging for those who find reading or writing difficult. Next slide, please. So finally, communication by in-person meetings. Participants I interviewed um, felt that it that in-person meetings allow for visual and other sensory clues. And one positive aspect that was quoted was that they can include several people. Um, in-person meetings were reported as particularly helpful for relationship building including creating a better sense of connection and building trust. However, um, there may be a sense of intrusion that might be caused from in-person home visit, visit, sorry. Um, nevertheless, one aspect, one positive aspect that was um, quoted around in-person meetings was the fact that it doesn't require new technology, but it does take time, effort and travel it's particularly helpful to those in crisis or who find digital communication more challenging, but might be an issue for those who find in-person meetings more stressful or exhausting. And it's also important to note that um, there's still a risk caused by COVID-19 and that uh, many disabled people might still be shielding or limiting their in-person interactions. Next slide, please. I'm going to discuss some of the implications for social workers. So starting with here, the implication for social workers' core values. Some overall implications for core social work values include the following. 
So bear in mind that Barry is the relationship building. Important member that support needed by disabled people impact confidentiality and agency. The distance created by digital technologies can be really helpful and beneficial, for example, when discussing more intimate matters. Important to remember that consent can be really difficult to obtain when not face to face. And likewise, there can be difficulty to get a full picture of a situation when you're not face to face with the person. I'm remembering that particular impairments interact with different digital technologies in very complex ways. Next slide, please. This is for training and support for social workers. So this slide discusses the training and guidance that was received by the social worker on the accessibility of digital technology. So no training on digital technology for with disabled people was received by any of the 15 social workers who participated in the study. Although some specialist teams were believed to have received some training, but also some social workers in generic teams have actually independently accessed training themselves. But remembering social workers are guided by legislation and local policy. And in some areas have developed their own guidance interestingly and only three out of the 15 social workers knew about the relevant guidelines developed by SCIE. On to the next slide please. The quotes on this slide are from three social workers and they really do highlight that training and guidance was wanted by social workers and particularly on the accessibility of digital technology. So the first quote reads as follows, will be a benefit for everyone because you know we're just making it up as we go along. The second quote is, I do think there's been a bit of a gap in terms of social work specific stuff around this is the ethics and values of this, this is how you'd use it here. And the final quote reads, there's certainly nothing but has been delivered to us along the lines of this is how this would or wouldn't work well for people with different disabilities, different groups, and these are the things you need to consider when you're asking them. And the next slide please. And the final point on training and support for social worker is really to consider the following issue. So firstly, the ethics, the values, professional standards, any practical issues, the importance of experimental learning, and remembering that different digital technologies might present challenges or opportunities for different disabled people, that there are many differences here. And importantly, really making digital technologies communication meaningful for example what types of questions are you going to ask when you're doing assessments remotely to better get the best outcome next slide please now we will move on to the final part of our webinar which is our recommendations and conclusion next slide please recommendations for social workers Using study findings and co-production with social workers, we've produced a guidance document with recommendations for social workers. Some of these recommendations and points include that social workers must consider the importance of choice of communication methods, that they should explore methods that are inclusive and excluding of people with different impairment and health conditions, Privacy and confidentiality can be compromised when using digital communications. That disabled people should be able to decide what works best for them. That social workers should seek training and develop skills to use digital technologies. And that some things are simply done better in person. Next slide, please. Advice for disabled people. Another one of our outputs is a guidance document for disabled people. In this document, we'll cover advice on topics like how to prepare for meetings with social workers, when to consider different options such as turning off your camera if it will better protect your safety or provide you with more privacy, when you might want to conduct remote meetings from a private space, how to and the importance of keeping communications professional, 
when you have a right to choose how you meet and communicate, the importance of asking for in-person meetings, if that works best for you, how to request any reasonable adjustments, how to get help to protect your rights and choices, for example, from different advocacy services, and when to consider the restrictions social workers may face in terms of their systems and access to different digital technologies. Next slide, please. Dissemination. In addition to our advice document for disabled people and our recommendations for social workers, we will also be producing a full report and a six page summary. We will be disseminating these outputs through both to, um, the British Association of Social Workers and Shaping Our Lives as channels, but we will also be working with key stakeholders such as Healthwatch, Think Local Act Personal, the Department of Health and Social Care, and other deaf and disabled people's organisations to ensure our work reaches the communities which it's been designed to serve. Next slide, please. And now we're on to our thank yous and concluding remarks. So in conclusion, um, disabled people are not always offered a choice of the communication method and so not always able to ask for one that would work for them best. This lack of choice means they may struggle to share important information with their social worker. Many policies in local authorities actually restrict the digital communication technologies that you're allowed to use as a social worker. And this means that it can make it really difficult for you to uphold your core values and principles of working. There's a need for social workers to receive more guidance and training on the use of digital technologies with disabled people. And although there are some resources and guidance already out there, it needs to be more widely distributed and social workers need to be made aware of it. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for listening today. We hope you find it interesting and useful. My contact details are below if you'd like to contact me or any of the uh, disabled lay researchers and um, we'd now be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you.